lights on. Good. Hi. You can still hear me, huh? Uh, that's good, because you know when I was singing, I had my hand like this, and I was playing with this button on my collar. And it wasn't the button. And I went, uh-oh. Oh, well. So, you know when we're singing a glorious day, right? And when we sing, someday the trumpet will sound, I'm going to pay Mel. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to have him hide in back there. And when we sing that line, I'm going to have Mel blow some kind of a thing on the trumpet. I, but you know, you're kind of thinking, you know, is, is, this, is this it? He's going to come now? Kind of, you listen to that singing, and it, it, sometimes why bother preaching? In my father's house. Yeah. Hey, it'll be short. Let's put it that way. In my father's house, there's a place for me. Amen. There's a place for you. You know Jesus. There's a place for you. Man, you never have to wonder. Um, I was talking to a guy one time, and I said uh, something about knowing where I'm going when I die. And he said, nobody can know that. And I was like, you know, if God loves you, if he's your father, do you think he's going to make you spend your whole life going... Well, you know, you may make it, you may not. I, I mean, he loves us. We're going to talk a little bit about that today. Um, a couple things I forgot to tell you is, uh, let's see, softball. Tuesday night, what time? 6.15, and is that the tech fields? Okay, so softball. And, and oh, the other thing I forgot to tell you is, I'm not Tony, I'm George. But <laughs> Mill kind of covered that, so. Uh, you know, every stage in life... Um, there's a learning curve, okay? There's a learning curve, every stage in life. And the problem with the learning curve, Mel and I were talking about this this morning, the problem with the curve is by the time you realize what um, are the rules for that stage in life, you're already mostly through it. So if I start crying and my mascara runs while I'm up here, um, it's not because I'm crying and it's not because I wear mascara, all right? Uh, we, I, I do real estate in my retirement, and we have this property out in the middle of nowhere. And I mean, it is in the middle of nowhere. There is nothing out there. Trees, there was a porcupine we saw. So we took our ATVs, me and my two buddies, and we're all in our 60s. And uh, we took our ATVs out there. We're young, spry guys. You know, we're pounding through this stuff. And, and um, I'm all, I always ride in the middle because I have the smallest ATV. And so when I get stuck, and notice I didn't say if, when I get stuck, one of them pulls me out. And of course, they're always, because we're guys and we're best friends, we've known each other for 50 years. You know how guys are when we're friends? Women, you don't know this, but guys are like this. We're always very kind and considerate to one another. <laughs> you know, the last time we went out, we're going across this beaver dam, and one, one buddy goes across, and I get halfway in the middle, and it dies. And I'm, so I'm in the middle of this beaver dam about that deep in water, and uh, my buddy that's ahead of me is filming it with his camera, <laughs> you know, and my buddy behind me is bent over, doubled on his bike, laughing at me, so yeah, that, my buddy, so anyway, so I ride in the middle, now when we're on roads, the problem with that is, is I get a lot of dust in my eyes, it takes generally a couple, three days for all that dust to work its way out. Like sometimes I wake up the next morning and my pillow will have like dark streaks on it because the dirt's coming out of my eyes in the middle of the night. So if, if you see like black running down here, if tears come out of my eyes, it's not because I'm such a great preacher that I, I get myself crying. It's because the dust is working its way out of my eyes. And also, I hurt in places I didn't know I had. I mean, everything hurts right now. Ah. Okay, how many of you watched David Jeremiah. Anybody are, listen to him, watch him? Let's see, okay. You know what? These buttons are worn off. I think that's the right one. That's the right one. Okay. David Jeremiah. What I want to do, I want to start this off by telling you a story that he told on his radio show this week. I won't get it 100% accurate, but I like the meaning behind it, and it will work its way into the message as time goes along. Um, so there's this pastor that gets on a plane, they're going somewhere or another. And as they're flying along, he says, 
you knew that you knew something was up because they said, uh, everybody fasten your seat belts, please, and stay in your seats. A little while later is, we will not be doing our drink service um, now because we're expecting some turbulence. Well, then they got this some turbulence. How many of you have been on a flight where there's a lot of turbulence? Anybody in particular? I, I, I flew to Disneyland one time when I was in California, and the weekend before that, a plane had crashed um, there, and then we flew to Disneyland like the next the day or two later, and it was just, it was bad. I mean, the plane was going, and it, it, was, it was bad. It was really bad. But anyway, they get out, the plane starts dropping and shaking and everything else, and this pastor kind of looks around, and you've got people that are crying. You've got people that are praying. You've got people that are white-knuckling. But there's this one girl, he thought she was about 11 years old, and she was just sitting there in her seat reading a book. You know? Everybody else's plane shaking apart. She's... Every now and then she'd lean back and she'd close her eyes. And she'd get up and she'd read her book. And this pastor was just, he was very impressed by this young lady. So the plane landed and um, he waited for her to come out of the plane. He got out first. And when she came out, he, 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 said, he said, little girl, I noticed how calm you were when that plane was shaking around. What, why, didn't that bother you? She says, no. My daddy's flying the plane. <laughs> and he's taking me home. Think about that. My daddy's flying the plane. And he's taking me home. Okay, preliminary stuff. I used to tell you that I would say this every time I spoke. And I... Well, I didn't lie, I forgot. That's another thing about being in your 60s, you forget more. Um, the Word of God, also known as the Bible. Be diligent to present yourselves approved to God as a worker who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the Word of Truth. That's 2 Timothy 2.15. Uh, this next, um, these next verses I got from um, Acts, obviously, because it says Acts 17.11. This was when uh, Paul and I believe it was Silas or Timothy, they were in Thessalon Thessalonica, ah, and um, they got thrown out of there. And so they went to Berea. So it says, These Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Always check to make sure I'm telling you the truth, that I am accurately handling the word of God. I know many of you think I'm infallible. The Gitche Gumi crowd, you don't know me, so you might think, wow, this guy's really on top of things, but the rest of these people, they know better. Check, and not only me, anybody, and Tony will affirm this too, make sure we're telling you the truth. Check your Bibles. Don't just sit there and listen and go, oh, okay, oh, I never knew that. Check us. Make sure we're telling you the truth. Anybody you hear, radio, I don't care where you hear them, make sure they are accurately handling the word of truth. And now, now we get, these are, these are the things I do show you every time. Fundamentals of growth. This is not just a Sunday. Like, for pray, we are to pray at all times. Pray without ceasing. Study your Bible. Study it. Don't just read it. Study it. Memorize it. Learn what it says. And fellowship. Fellowship is not just a Sunday morning thing or a Sunday evening thing. Fellowship with other believers is something we should be doing all week long. I mean, go out for coffee. Um, get together for whatever. If you want to get together for a formal Bible study, I know there's, there's several of them going on around there. Make sure you get together with your brothers and sisters in Christ during the week. It really helps you to grow, especially in these times when everything is so insane. Okay, and another, this is another one of the things I do every week, or every time I preach. Focusing. Now, Pastor Tony talked about keeping your focus. Things are nuts out in the world right now, as we are all very much aware. How do you keep your focus? These are the important things. We are to go. We are to make disciples of all the nations. Now, all the nations means 
Italy, France, and some really odd places like Muratiria, Lorium, Bumbletown. Nobody is exempt from this. Go, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And what does Jesus say? What's his last words to his disciples? Lo, I am. I am. What does that mean? I am. Who's I am? God. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. We are to pursue peace with one another. We are to pursue peace with the world. Now, obviously, we can't shade Scripture to be at peace with the world. But we are not to pick fights we don't have to pick. And we are always to be ready to make a defense for the hope that, was, that is within us, yet with gentleness and respect. So if we are always to be ready to make a defense, we better know how to do it, right? Can't make a defense if you don't know the Bible. So you need to pray, study the Bible, fellowship. Kind of circular thinking here, huh? Okay. Now last time, we got here. Yes, last time we talked, when I spoke, we talked about the fruit of the Spirit. Fruit being singular. Um, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. That's what we talked about. Now, many of the commentaries that I read, actually I didn't read one that disagreed with, it, with this, said fruit is singular. The fruit of the Spirit is love. Everything else is a manifestation of love. So, this is, these are the two definitions. Can you read this, by the way? I can never tell when I'm, when I'm doing this if you can read it or not, because, you know, when it's that far away from me on your computer, it's one size, and sometimes I put it on the wall and I go, oh, maybe you can't see that. But anyway, okay, agape, which is many, if not most of the times in Scripture, you see the word love. It is agape, love. Agape, according to Unger, means uh, love is the highest characteristic of God the one attribute in which all others harmoniously blend. And uh, this next one is from Barclay from his uh, commentary to the Ephesians and the Galatians. Agape, the Christian word, means unconquerable benevolence. Isn't that nice? Unconquerable benevolence. It means that no matter what a man may do to us by way of insult, or injury, or humiliation, we will never seek anything else but his highest good. Wow. Think about that. No matter what somebody does to us, we still seek for his highest good. It is therefore a feeling of the mind as much as of the heart. It concerns the will as much as the emotions. It describes the deliberate effort which we can make only with the help of God, never to seek anything but the best, even for those who seek the worst for us. That is, that's something we can't do. That's why it is a fruit of the Spirit. Now, how important is this type of love? Anyone who does not love and the agapeo here, I believe, is the verb. I'm looking back at Pastor Nolan to see if he nods at me. Is that the verb, agapeo? He's looking at me going, just go, keep going, huh? Okay, I'll do that. Um, does Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. How important is, it, is this type of love? A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you you also are to love one another. How did Jesus love us? While we were yet sinners, he died for us. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. So I wonder, do all people know I'm a disciple of Jesus because of the love I demonstrate? You don't have to answer that question. 
But this is what we're told to do. So, the fruit, oops, wait, went one too far. There we go. So the fruit of the Spirit, it's the fruit of the Spirit. We don't manufacture love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. We don't, we don't manufacture this. This isn't something that we try really hard and we produce it. This is, comes from God. We don't manufacture this stuff. It's a production, what did I put here? It's a, it's a production of Holy Spirit creations. You should get a t-shirt like that. Fruit of the Spirit, Holy Spirit creations. Now we experience forms of the fruit. We, we all experience love. We experience joy, peace, so forth. All of these characteristics we experience. But we don't experience, why is that? Keeps jacking around. There we go. We don't experience the type, the fruit of the Spirit unless we have the Spirit. All right, now, there we go. Okay, so the fruit of the Spirit is love. Love manifests itself in joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and self control. If we think of love as light, and the characteristics, the, the characteristics of love would be kind of like running a light through a prism, and the colors that you see are kind of like this. Does that come out? Yeah, it looks better here than it does back there. Anyway, the light of the Holy Spirit, the love coming into the church, and it refracts into love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. This is, this is what we should present to the world. This is what they should see in us. God's light into the church. So that kind of makes us Walking Rainbows, which is the title of this message, by the way. Um, you know what? I'll, I'll get into this later, but this, what this message was supposed to call, I had to write it down because I forgot. It was supposed to be called um, Definitions and Practical Applications of the Fruit of the Spirit. I'd have gone home myself. I'd have like, man, that sounds dry. But um, so that's the title. So, you know when you're planning a message, I'm going to talk to Tony about this someday. What I was going to do this week on his last time I talked about love, so I thought, okay, this time I'll talk about each fruit of the Spirit are, are the manifestations of the fruit, depending on which way you define that, and what joy means, and how, what the practical application of joy is in our life. And, you know, as the more I looked at it, I thought, that sounds really boring. You know, I, that doesn't sound like something that's going to hold anybody's interest. But I was still looking into it. And then I got this verse. It kept referring me back when I'm studying this to um, Galatians 5.16. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. So, walk by the Spirit. There's a story behind this, you know. Um, I've been a follower of Jesus for about 47 and a half years. And if you would have asked me last week, what does it mean to walk by the Spirit? I would have said, well, it means send down in... Because I really never quite grasped what it meant. So then those of you who are out there thinking, well, then why didn't you ever study it like you tell us all to do? Well, the obvious reason is because I do. Um, good question. So I'm studying this, and God kept bringing me back to this verse. And I says, so you want me to go in front of a church full of people and talk about something that I don't really quite understand myself. He didn't say it. He didn't do this. You know, he, I, don't, I don't know if God has thumbs. But anyway, no, but I, I just, this is what he wanted me to do. I don't know why it is whenever I think, okay, I know what I'm going to do for a message, God always says, really? Hmm. And he does stuff like this to me. Is this his sense of humor? I, I'm not quite sure. Somebody, I, so anyway, so I spent this week trying to figure out um, how I was going to convey to you something that I don't fully understand myself. 
I will tell you that I, I understand it a lot more now than I did going into this week, this past week. Uh, there's, there's walking by the Spirit and being indwelled by the Spirit are two different things. So I'm going to deal with the indwelling part first, um, just briefly, and then I'll go to, it really is hard to read that, isn't it? That's too small. I'll have to make it bigger next time, use more slides. I guess when I have too many slides, I think it's going to go too long, so I crush everything. I guess that doesn't make any sense, does it? Oh, well. Neither does me preaching on walking by the Spirit, so hey, at least I'm consistent in my inconsistencies. All right, so this is from Acts 2, 30, I can barely read this on here. Hmm. Okay, this is from Peter's um, sermon after the day of Pentecost. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Now you got to imagine the Holy Spirit's working on these people's hearts. They hear this message and they go, what have we done? The person we've been waiting for, our nation since forever, and we killed them. I, I don't know if we can quite understand, maybe if you think of some of the most shocking moments that have happened in the past, in your life, uh, the shock that hits you when you first heard of something really terrible. These people are going, brothers, what shall we do? They were, must have been beside themselves. And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, and you, you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. So when you turn your life over to Jesus, the Spirit immediately enters your life. He dwells in you permanently. He doesn't leave you. He comes in. Actually, many really wonderful things happen when you accept Jesus. But before I get to that, um, that last thing, for the promises for you and for your children and for all, here's where we come in, who are far off. That's us. We were the ones that are far off. We're a couple thousand years removed. That promise is permanent. You accept Christ, that promise is yours. Okay, so when you re this is kind of a side note here. When you repent and ask Jesus into your life, these are some of the things that happen. Now, I have verses written down here, but I want you to give me verses instead. So, number one, your sins, past, present, and future, are atoned or paid for. Where is that? What places do you know of? Those of you at home, you can shout, but I won't hear you. But you, you guys can. Where does it say, where are some of the places it says your sins, past, present, and future, are atoned for, paid for? It's a good place. Good one. Give that, give that woman a candy bar or something there. All right. Number two, you receive the Holy Spirit. Where is that? The people at home, I can hear them better than you guys. I, that's weird. All right. I got to give this away, huh? One place is John 13, 13 through 15. Ted must not be able to hear me because I know Ted's got all of this here. He's, you know, he's always the walking uh, the Bible, biblical uh, encyclopedia when we need a verse. We, we go to Ted. All right. Number three, you are guaranteed eternal life in heaven with God. Guaranteed. This is an important one. Everybody should know this. John 3.16. That's the easy one, though. I don't know. You only get half a candy bar from that. Number four. You will not be judged for your sin. Jesus' death on the cross paid for your sin. Now, if you can come up with this one, this is the John, you gave me John 3.16. Do you know the answer to that one? You gave it away. John 3.17 is a good one for that. Uh, John 5.24 is another one. There's some beautiful, wonderful, eternal miracles that happen the moment you turn your life over to Christ. 
You have the indwelling. The Holy Spirit lives within you. He will never leave. You are given eternal life. Your Father has a house in heaven for you. And no one can take you out of his hands. It says that God keeps, he holds our salvation. He holds it. That's why you read where it says, nobody can snatch someone out of his hand. God holds it. He holds your salvation. You will never lose it. It's there permanently. Okay, so that's indwelling. How do we walk by the Spirit? Oh, we still have time. I can't get out of this, can I? Okay. Everything hinges on this when you think about it. For the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, suppose, etc. And it says we have to walk by the Spirit. I found some verses I, uh, I think are really good that kind of tend to back this up. This is John 16, 13 through 15. When the Spirit of truth, now this is, this is Jesus speaking in this verse. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. So the indwelling spirit will guide us into all truth. When we walk by the spirit, he, glor- he will glorify God. The Holy Spirit will always glorify God. Um, all the, where does it say? I lost my place. All that the Father has is mine. Everything the Father has, Jesus has. And the Holy Spirit will impart this to us. He will impart the knowledge on how to live and how to walk by him. And how does he do this? We're going to do a little rerun here. This is from last week. You remember Pastor Tony had this verse? This is, um, talks about Elijah after he defeated the prophets of Baal and then Jezebel said he was going to, or she was going to kill him. And he ran to this mountain to his cave in the mountain it says and he said God said to Elijah go out and stand on the mount before the Lord and behold the Lord passed by and a great and strong wind tore the mountain and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord but the Lord was not in the wind and after the wind an earthquake but the Lord was not in the earthquake and after the earthquake a fire but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, the sound of a low whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And behold, there came a voice to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? Now, I would like to do, uh, I'd like to present this how Pastor Tony did. But after ATV riding all over the dark parts of Frida yesterday, if I tried to bend over, you'd have to come and lift me back up again because I'm like really stiff and sore. My point here is, and this is very relevant to what we're seeing here today, there is chaos all around us. The world is in a state that I've never seen it in. And I, my 97-year-old neighbor says he's never seen anything like what is going on right now in the world. There is chaos. There's natural disasters. There's all kinds of terror. Well, last year we know about all the fires um, that happened. Really, what this verse is saying, um, all this stuff we see, but that's not God. God is that quiet little voice, that quiet, I don't know, I, I hate to say feeling, that's within you, deep inside of you, that's God. Why doesn't God? Could God cause earthquakes? And yeah, when we read in Revelation, we hear all the things that are going to happen in the end times. God is in control. He doesn't have to rage. He is in control of everything at all times. Always in control. He is that quiet little voice. When you're walking by the Spirit, in my, and I'm gonna, this is my experience only. I don't know how it works for you, but in my experience, 
when the Holy Spirit is speaking to me, it's in a voice where you kind of go, who was that? And you're like, it's just very faint. It always agrees with Scripture. Any urgings you get, you're not going to hear the Holy Spirit say, go out and get drunk this weekend. No, it's always going to glorify God and be in harmony with Scripture. You get urges sometimes, like you might be, I, I've heard Les Olala talks about this, and I, I, many of you know Les. He's amazing. Um, he has such a gift for evangelism. He'll be standing there, and there's some guy in the grocery store putting milk in his cart. He'll walk over there. Do you know Jesus Christ? And the guy will say, no, if I said that, the guy would probably hit me with the milk. Les says it, and he goes, well, I've heard about him. Well, why don't you tell me about him? You know, why does it happen to some people? Don't be asking me that stuff. You'll get this urge to either say something or to not say something or to do something or not do something. Um, I remember one time I was saving up to buy a piece of farm equipment. And it took me a while. This was years ago, and I wasn't as wealthy as I am now. Yeah, the ones that know me are laughing about that. And I had the money. And I, I'm not, believe me, I'm not blowing my horn here, but it's an example. And there was a missionary that came into the church, and they needed a certain amount of money. You know, this isn't fair. But I really felt like God saying, so I gave it to him. I mean, it wasn't a lot. It wasn't like a $10,000 piece of equipment. But for me, it was, you know, that's the kind of things that how God speaks to you. He might tell you to talk to somebody or help somebody. That's how you hear, that's how I hear the voice of God. I don't know how some of you, how it works with some of you, but it's generally a very quiet voice, and if I'm not listening, I might miss it, and then realize later that, oh, you know what? I had a feeling that I should have said this, or I shouldn't have said this, or I should have done this, or I shouldn't have done this, and I didn't listen. Being in touch with the Spirit, walking with Him, This is 1 Corinthians 2, 9 and 10. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, is what God has prepared for those who love him. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. Think about that. What God has for us is things we can't even imagine. He's got it for us. He's got what we need to get through chaotic times. He will give that to us if we're walking by the Spirit. So one of the most important things that you need to walk by the Spirit is you need to be obedient. This is like, I think, one of the most important things. By the way, anybody that has a different take on this, I would love to talk to you about it because I'm learning this myself. I'm trying to figure this all out and work it into a... a I think it's called uh, David, systematic theology. Is that, he's, David's taking theology classes, so I'm bouncing bounce all these terms off him. My own personal theology, how I deal with this. So obedience is really critical. We must obey God's will as revealed in Scripture. Very important. Uh, several verses on this. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. That's really a complicated verse. That, by the way, is Jesus speaking. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. I don't see any room for a but in there. But Lord, what about, no, if you love me, and again, this is agape love, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And by this we know that we have come to know him, if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments, is, that's harsh words there, huh? We don't do that in today's society. I, I, this probably wouldn't work in modern things, but, you're a liar. If you don't keep his commandments and you say you know him, you're lying. And the truth is not in you. But whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walks. So we need to obey. We need to obey what God tells us we're supposed to do and not do. It, I think, is 
critically important. Now, a little aside here. None of us is perfect. We are all going to fall. So if you're sitting there going, oh, but I did this and I, I don't fall, I did, well, yes, we're all like that. Even me, I know it's a shock, but yeah, we all fall. I am regretfully a man of many words. And you know what happens when you're a man of many words? You say a whole lot of things you never should have said. Yeah. I, I, it's hard. This isn't easy stuff. I have to try to constantly watch what's coming out of my mouth because many times it shouldn't be coming out of my mouth. So we need to obey. And we're going to fail, we know that. Read 1 John chapter 1 if you want the cure to that because we're, you know, you guys need to work too. Okay, something else. Colossians 3, 16 and 17. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. We need to live lives that reflect the God we say we serve. Um, so you get into the nitty-gritty. What do you watch on TV? On your computer? What music do you listen to? Whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Everything you're doing at any point in time, you should be able to say, thank you, God, that I'm able to fill in the blank. I'm able to listen to this song. I'm able to read this book. I'm able to be involved in this club, group, whatever. If you can't say that, then you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. You're not obeying. The Spirit can't work through us if we're not obeying. Ephesians 6, 10 through 12. Finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Never doubt that we are in a war. We are in a spiritual war. In this country... I think you're starting to see it now. I remember years and years ago, decades ago, um, you know, I always want to say Patty Hart because I graduated with Patty Hart, but it's Patty Fisher. Patty and Bob were somewhere, I, I heard this from Ginger, who is Patty's, Patty's sister, for those of you who don't know. They, they, in other countries, there's some really, really crazy spiritual things that happen that we generally don't see here, but they see in other countries. But we are in a war here. It is a war. Think about it. Think if, look at your life as it stands right now and think, okay, if I was going to be in total obedience to God and everything that I do I was able to, I can praise him for, what would I have to leave off right now? There's some... I, I, I haven't watched it lately, but Last Man Standing. You ever watch Last Man Standing? Don't say yes. Last Man Standing. It's a pretty funny show, especially if you're kind of of a conservative nature. But there's a whole lot in that show that's not, not right. What kind of music do you listen to? Up until I was able to figure out how um, Pandora worked on my phone, I couldn't figure out, I couldn't get any type of music I listened to. So I'd listen to the Eagles and the Beatles and things like that from my, my age when I was a kid. But of course, that music, when I listened to it back then, it carried a lot of memories that I would rather not have. Well, then I found out that you can program your own music into that. And so when I came to Christ, I listened to a lot of 70s Jesus music. So... That's what I listen to all the time now. I got, you know, second chapter of Acts and Keith Green and Phil Keggy and all these kind of people. And, and actually, 
I didn't used to listen to Petra because they were kind of wild. But if you ever listen to the lyrics of a Petra song, they, they have some really good theology in their songs. I was kind of amazed. It's okay, I'll listen to Petra now. Anyway, okay. We are in a war. We have an enemy that will never give you a break. He will never cut you any slack. He will do everything he possibly can to bring you down. If you want to walk by the Spirit, you need to obey God. You need to know his word so you know what to obey. So, speaking of reruns, how do you know God's word? How do you know what we're supposed to do? We need to pray. We can't manufacture the fruits of the Spirit. We need to pray that God will bring those fruits out in our life. We need to pray. We need to study our Bible so we know what we're supposed to do and what we're not supposed to do. And we need to be in fellowship. That's incredibly important. Because our brothers and our sisters, our job is to be, as brothers and sisters in Christ, to be at peace with one another. Do you know what that means? That means if I offend Joel, Joel doesn't sit there and go, oh, you know, that's, it's George. He's a man of many words. I'll let it go. No. Because he's not doing me any favors by, my, by not calling me on the carpet for saying something that is ungodly, that's not something that Christ would want to hear. Joel has the job, and isn't this fun, to come to me and say, George, I need to talk to you. You know, you said something, and, and it, it's really kind of offensive. Or it, it hurt. I need to know that. That's what it means. We have to pursue peace with one another. It's not just saying, oh, it's okay. No problem. Well, maybe, maybe you can just forgive it and forget it, but you're not doing the person a favor by letting it go. You need to talk to them. That's hard to do. Have you ever done it? Don't ask me if I've ever done it, because I haven't. Now, I call these fundamentals of growth. There may be more. There may be other ones that you would like to say that, oh, this is really important. This is just a starting point for you. To walk in the Spirit, you need to obey. You need to know what God wants you to do. You need to be in tune with the Spirit. If you're watching smut on TV, you're not going to be in tune with the Spirit. You can't come to church on Sunday and say, okay, now I'm going to be in tune with the Spirit because I'm not watching whatever. I, we don't have TV. We got Roku, so we, don't, we can still get TV, but you know, I don't watch it myself. I watch The Chosen, that's what I like. Anyway, so this is some hard stuff. When you have to start looking at your life going, but I really like fill in the blank. And you're telling me, I, I'm not telling you nothing. I'm saying if you want to walk by the Spirit, you have to obey. You have to live a life that reflects the person you want to obey on more than Sunday. So I guess ultimately the question comes down to, Who's flying your plane? Let's pray. Father, thank you that you and your word are eternal. That you ask us to do things we can't do. You tell us we have to do things that we can't do. But that's the whole point, isn't it? If we could do this stuff on our own, we wouldn't need you. But we need you. We are fighting a battle that even though with you we are the most powerful beings in the universe next to you when we are walking with you, we still need you every moment, every hour. We need you in our lives, directing us, helping us to be the type of people you want us to be forgiving us when we fail, and helping us to ever strive more to be more like you, to be more examples of love to our community, to each other, to our world. Thank you for all you have for us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, George. Let's stand together as we close with a song. Teach me thy way, O Lord.